Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and we are continuing Artillery Week but this show will also be added to the Tank Destroyer playlist from a few weeks ago because it is about tank destroyers, stroke assault guns, stroke tank hunters, stroke um, self all those different variables and we will get into some of those why are different terminology used for different vehicles, we'll get into that but um, if you're new to the channel, again, we're getting some some increasing numbers of viewers joining us. So thank you. Welcome aboard. Don't forget, all the information you always need is in the description below. You'll find the social media links, links to my guests' websites, books, its books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Without further ado, uh, uh, we are going to bring in our guest, J.R. Tracy. He's joining us from Massachusetts. So good afternoon. How are you today, sir? Very good. I'm actually in... Uh... New York, Hudson Valley. So. Okay, yeah, well, uh, you're in Hudson Valley. Okay, never mind. You're close. Right? We're about 20 miles from Massachusetts. <laughs> so tank destroyers, assault guns, self-propelled guns, mobile artillery, there are so many different labels that get put to these types of vehicles, and they end up being used for the things that they were intended for. And, of course, in combat, they get used for things they weren't necessarily intended for, and they do different have different types of success at different at different um at these uh, aspects but in terms of yourself where, where did your interest in the soviet side of artillery and self-propelled guns come from well i mean i have a general interest in the topic as a whole but uh my curiosity about soviet equipment in particular is that it's just not particularly well covered in the literature i've had access to historically so i've always kind of craved you know a little more information and uh, recently I've come across a few sources that have, I would say my understanding is miles better than it was even just a couple of years ago, thanks to these resources. Um, there's a fellow uh, who runs a website called Tank Archives and he yeah. has access to quite a bit of primary source material and has done a great job along with some colleagues in translating a great deal of that. And so just from that, I think I have a, a much better understanding, not, not just of Soviet, you know, artillery and tank destroyers generally, but just the Soviet, you know, R&D process, how they brought this kit from, you know, notional concept to um, realization to battlefield performance to repeating that cycle and improving as, as the war went on. Um, and I'm so, sure we'll get, in, sorry, we'll get into sorry. that discussion as it goes on. And I think one of the things that, that the myths that we will try and bust is that there's a lot of ideas that the Soviets just throw you know, quantity at things. They don't give much thought to anything. They don't have any design pros. It's all just very um, brute force and ignorance. And as Prit Brutal and others have said on the channel, that's that's not really the case. The Soviets are, are, are looking at armor. They're looking at angles of, of, of armor. They're looking at what they can do. The idea they just kind of bolt steel onto tractors is, is an out, old, outdated view. But you've come armed with a PowerPoint that you'll be guiding us through, folks. We'll do sure. questions as we go along today, and um, and but basically over to you, Jr. All righty, let's see if I can roll through the slide here. So, I mean, the origins of um, you know Soviet tank destroyers and their design and like you know kind of doctrine um, started early on. Like uh, I think in 1940, there was a a paper drawn up where they realized they needed uh, a family of self-propelled guns, you know, for purposes of I think they might have had like three basic types of. Uh, tank destroyers, bunker busters, and just a more of a general infantry support vehicle. Um, and the, the notion of these vehicles, um, initially at least, foresaw like a, a, a turreted vehicle, sort of what, what the U.S. went with. And then Barbarossa occurred, which sort of kind of was a major distraction for all people concerned. So a lot of those plans were shelled, particularly the, the notion of a, of a turreted vehicle. Um, and those are kind of intriguing. And again, if you go to Peter's site, you can see some of those examples. Um, in the midst of all that, they started turning towards more expedient measures. Um, the more general concept of a self-propelled gun was pursued with something I think a lot of people are familiar with, the uh, SU-76 family. And it, it was turretless. And alongside that were developed other ideas almost all of which I don't think they ever did produce a, a production turreted self-propelled vehicle during the war. And the question is, why was that? Um, my thinking from the reading I see and just from the circumstances they were in, it, it's ex expedience. I mean, yep. a turretless vehicle uses less resources. It's simpler to design. It's simpler to construct. It has some tactical advantages in the sense it's a lower profile. It has significant tactical disadvantages in that it's, you know, a non-turreted vehicle. So, um, you know, very vulnerable to, to, you know, flanking movement by by enemy vehicles. 
But generally speaking, they fixed upon an idea and uh, I think ultimately executed it pretty well. Um, now, my general talk is on tank destroyers and the SU-76 family is not particularly a tank destroyer, but touching on what you said earlier, if a vehicle was capable of destroying a tank, at some point it was going to be a tank destroyer, <laughs> whatever the original design intent or specification might have been. Um, the SU-76 has a interesting and somewhat tragic early history. Uh, the What is truly known as SU-76 was also called SU-12 in its development cycle. And this was meeting a general spec for a, a infantry support vehicle, a self-propelled gun mounting the 76 millimeter, um, what is the divisional artillery piece, the ZIS-3, a very capable piece. You know, even the Germans used it on their martyrs and whatnot. Um, it was based on a light tank chassis. Um, there's a fellow, uh, S.A. Ginsberg, a Soviet vehicle designer with a legacy that included the T-26, the BT-2, uh, many other vehicles. He was just a, you know, quite a significant figure in Soviet AFB design. Um, got a little bit experimental with this vehicle. He decided to monkey with the light tank he was working with, thought something along the lines instead of the configuration he had, he decided parallel engines and two gearboxes was a good idea. Um, this turned out to be actually a pretty horrible idea. Uh, he managed to build 600 of these, but uh, despite their obvious effectiveness when everything was working, they were suffering something along the lines of a 45% mechanical failure rate. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly something had to be done. Uh, one of the things that was done is that S.A. Ginsburg was reassigned to a combat unit. And he had the honor of uh, joining a tank brigade that was at the tip of Fifth Guard Tank Army's counterattack in August of 1943. And he did not live to see the end of the day. So failure has consequences when you're designing vehicles for the Red Army. The good news is the rest of his design team seemed pretty motivated um, as a result of that and came up with the SU-76M. Um, this is what most people will think of when they think of an SU-76, and that corrected most of the flaws. They ended up building 13,700 of these. You saw this thing all the way through to the end of the war. Um, these are interesting vehicles in that they're open-topped, um, the SU-76M is, uh, although they did start to put some tops on them towards the end of the war. And I have to say, you know, this, it's, they say it takes a brave man to be a coward in the Red Army, but uh, it takes a brave man to uh, crew an SU-76M. To be in an open top vehicle in Breslau in 1945 was probably uh, even more exciting mm. than absolutely necessary. But, uh, but these were extremely ex effective vehicles and kind of proved the self-propelled gun concept as a, as a core um, piece of kit for, for the Red Army. Um, if you move on from that, we have a couple pictures here. That's the SU-12. Now, the, that's an open-top SU-12. As I was saying, these things had significant drivetrain issues. Um, crews complained about the open-top. They put tops on them, and you can imagine adding a few hundred pounds of metal did not improve the performance of an already stressed-out drivetrain. Mm -hmm. and that probably accelerated Ginsburg's ultimate fate. These are the SU-76Ms. And there's one you see in late war. Um, you can imagine uh, going down a street that hadn't quite been fully cleared and coming across some uh, ambitious Hitler youth in an upper story window might end your day pretty quickly. And the crews, JR, uh, of these types of vehicles, do they come from the artillery branch, from the tank branch? From, from Are they pulled in from, from nowhere and, and trained for this? How, how does it work? Well, uh, my understanding, and if, I, if somebody's in the question out there can correct me, SU-76 artillery branch, um, one of the things about it that they struggled with a bit is I think it only had um, panoramic sights. It didn't have like a telescopic sight, so it did have trouble engaging uh, enemy vehicles as a result of that. Uh, but I do believe it was artillery branch. The SU-85 and SU-100 series that we'll talk about in a minute those were specifically assigned to tank destroyer units, and that was a distinct branch. Um, anyone in any of these vehicles is going to be selected a, at a higher level than an infantryman. So these are technical, technical branches. And I, I do believe that the, the 76 family, um, the 
SU-122, ISU-122, ISU-152. I believe those are artillery branch also with uh, with some training and indirect fire, things like that. So Jeez. good question. But these, these are selected above infantry, certainly, and probably selected above um, straight tank units. Thanks. Now, the SU-122 um, came along not directly as a result of encountering German Stugs, but were influenced by German Stugs. Um, one of the things the Soviets did, they captured a lot of equipment. They didn't let anything go to waste. They experimented a bit. They tried mounting uh, 122 millimeter howitzer on Stug chassis. And some of these actually saw action as the SG-122. Um, it was kind of a Frankenstein monster, as you'd expect. Um, but they did learn a bit from it. They had quite a bit more success with what was called the SU-76I. These were 76 millimeter um, guns mounted also on either Panzer III or Stug chassis. They ended up cranking out 600 of these. That, that's quite a bit. And I think those things saw action into 1944, I believe. But as a result of this, they decided, well, let's try to build our own home, our own, you know, home design kit. Um, and that led to the SU-122. Now, there is a happy coincidence in that, I'm not sure it's a coincidence, but a happy pairing of two design bureaus in close proximity. Um, artillery factory number eight, which eventually gave birth to artillery factory number nine, and the UZTM, which is uh, the Ural, I think it's heavy machinery works. Um, it's out in the Urals, also called Ural mesh. Um, they're quite close by each other. Uh, the artillery factor, factory was building the 122 millimeter howitzer. UZTM was building T-34s. Together, they combined to create what ultimately became the SU-122. Initially, I think it was indexed the SU-35. Uh, and again, this was a, a like a, a very successful design that they put out in a very short period of time. They used the M30S howitzer, the short-barreled um, howitzer uh, that uh, has a very distinctive st stub nose look. When you see the vehicle, you see like a big block around the, the base of the barrel, and that, that's essentially armor protecting the, uh, the recoil mechanisms, you know, the hydraulic cylinders. But they have a very distinctive look, pretty successful design, um, primarily used for um, bunker busting and whatnot, but it could, you know, put some pain onto a Panzer if, if it encountered one. They ended up building about 640 of these. Again, not a true tank destroyer, certainly used to engage tanks, I'm sure, but it was as much a proof of concept, and more importantly, it laid a foundation for design development production experience for these two entities, the Artillery Factory and the UZTM. See a couple picture of those. That is the SG-122, and you know, if you know much about German vehicles, you can recognize the six road wheels for the Panzer III chassis there. And as you can see, that's a bit nose heavy. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of metal in the front of, a, the front of that yeah. vehicle. There is an SU-76 I. I couldn't find a, a good picture of one from the period, but this is one that survived the war. Um, again, you see the six road wheels and then the 76 millimeter gun. And if you know a T-34, you can see that, again, has that distinctive sort of uh, cuff around the base of the barrel that uh, you saw on the, on the uh, T-34-76. Now, there is the SU-122 itself. Now, one thing I've read is you not allowed to traverse left and right, left and right from the casemate, but um, it got apparently was a little vulnerable to uh, small arms fire even uh, when it was cantered too way too far one way or the other. So one adjustment they made I think was was to widen that shield a bit. And there's another SU-122 again. Just a that thing looks like it's it's ready for business. Not the prettiest vehicle in the world, but it seemed to be successful at what it did. One thing to note: these, these things were carried all the characteristics of T-34s, you know, like a fair amount of speed, decent uh, terrain crossing ability, fair amount of armor, and they tried to maintain that slope. I mean, that's a big casemate. So you can imagine it's uh, presented a quite a large target, but at least they have some slope to it. So from all this, they discovered that you know, th these were nice weapons. They, they were primarily, primarily infantry support, some indirect fire. Um, I will say the SU-122, I think, originally spec'd for a 40% elevation, which is quite a bit of elevation on a closed casemate gun. It ultimately, I think, clocked out like 23 degrees elevation. So there was some expectation these would be used beyond, beyond, behind the lines 
in an indirect fire role. I'm not sure how much that actually occurred. Um, I was just going to jump in, JR, because sure. it's interesting that the, the dates we're talking about, this is the transition period when the, the Red Army is going from mostly on the defensive to beginning to think about being on the, on the offensive. And so sometimes the, you know, the, the language we use in the self-propelled gun or assault gun or tank destroyer, I mean, the Allies, I mean, Americans tend to use tank destroyers in a kind of a defensive role after you've point you know, poked the, the, the cage that is the German bear, the Germans come out and then the tank destroyers are then deployed to 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 sit and then receive the German tanks that come out. So the, the Soviets, from your, your, your research into this, are they taking into consideration the fact the war is gradually shifting and are they trying to anticipate that or are they still building vehicles for what they were using previously, if that makes sense? I think they're aiming for versatility. I mean, yeah. they were certainly... One of the fascinating things for me, unrelated to this specific topic, was how much they prepare for the long war. I mean, there's a memoir I read about a kid who signed up like the day of Barbarossa. He went to his local recruiting station, give me a rifle, like 17 year old kid. I want to go to the front. They send him to radio school for like months. And after that, they send him to another like signals college. You would think like in the summer of 1941, they're thinking about how do we stop the Germans now? They're planning for, you know, two, three years in advance. And I think the same thing holds for their vehicle, you know, just general R&D into vehicles and ordnance as a whole. They were prepared for a longer war. And the, the vehicles we're talking about had a lot of versatility, both in the attack and defense. I will say these things got in a lot of trouble on the attack. Um, you'll see in the documents that describe doctrine and, uh, you know, combat experience and lessons learned type thing. <laughs> it's a don't let the don't let the assault guns get ahead of the tanks because it just ends up they end up in a lot of trouble for a couple of reasons. Um, none of these vehicles had hull machine guns, uh, only a small amount. And usually the ISU series had like even an anti-aircraft uh, machine gun. They really had a hard time defending themselves against German infantry. Um, I read at least two specific memoir accounts of assault gun crews dismounting with their, you know, PPSH or whatever their, you know, their submachine gun to assist another vehicle in their battery that was being overrun by, by a close assault infantry. I mean, that, that's not what you want your vehicle crews doing. No. Um, ideally they were supported by just, you know, dedicated infantry to just to fend off German assault teams, but uh, that wasn't always the case. And they also had a problem when they got ahead of the tanks and that that's when the vulnerability to flank attack occurred. Um, the ISU series, very well armored. I mean, they're as well armored as, you know, as an IS-2, um, but they were defeated by flank shots. Uh, they determined like a, most of the ones they lost in combat, two other vehicles were killed by, by flank attacks when they got too far ahead of, of their own supporting tanks and infantry. So you said about the fact that they're trying to create something that is is flexible and, and can be used for a variety of roles. It may be a good time to bring Peter O'Connell's question, is, which is, had the Soviets developed an independent tank destroyer organization or were tank destroyers distributed across other formations? And indeed, does that change as the war goes on? Is what they're doing with them in 41, 42 different to what they're doing in 43, 44 and 44, 45? They ultimately developed, uh, as we mentioned earlier, a, a dedicated tank destroyer branch. Typically, they were formed into regiments of 20 vehicles um, with, with a command vehicle for a 21st vehicle. And these were assigned like a like a at the core level, like a cavalry corps would have a regiment, a tank corps would have a regiment, a mechanized corps would have a regiment. Sometimes they amalgated three regiments into a tank brigade, which would be a higher level asset, and I, I'm sorry, tank destroyer brigade, which would be a higher level asset. And that might be a, distributed a bit more. But one of the things you see again and again in the doctrinal material is don't break up these regiments. They're meant to be used en masse. I mean, they don't want the penny packet, you know, three here, two there, five there. They were trained to be in, you know, mutually supporting and working as just this cohesive whole. And th that I found to be very interesting. And the kind of admonitions you see repeatedly indicates that local commanders probably violated that. And so they had to keep reinforcing that idea to be used en masse. But they were a dedicated branch. They did have their own doctrine. Um, it gets a little squishy with the ISU 122, 152, which kind of had what you were touching on earlier, a rule, a role that was both tank destroyer and assault gun. I mean, they were used whatever circumstances demand as circumstances demanded. 
even though they weren't always a dedicated tank destroyer badge type wearing uh, formation. And it's interesting as well because of this, they're learning from the Germans, but they're also learning what not to do with the Germans. Because when we talk about the, the after Barbarossa goes tits up for the Germans and they, right. they don't go into immediate fall back, they, as we know, they're very good at holding a line and using these little, as you would say, kind of penny packets of, of their types of vehicles and tank destroyers and tanks, things like that. And, and the Soviets realize that this is a, a good technique the Germans are employing until the Soviets start learning how to deal with it by mass formations and lots of artillery. So it seems that they're seeing what the Germans do well, but they've also adopted how they've countered that what the Germans do well. And then I'm trying to come up with a third solution that is, is, is somehow better than both. If that, again, if that makes sense, the way my brain is working there. Well, it, it does. And, you know, touching on what you said, like nothing exceeds like excess and, you know, what's better than, than, you know, five SU 185s. How about 20 SU 185, SU 85s? I mean, that concentration of firepower, even with the SU 76s, uh, again, when, when you look at their, uh, doctrine, they are instructed, even though they're not tank destroyers, if they encounter enemy vehicles, all fire is to be concentrated on the, on the German vehicles, you know, at, at the exclusion of the original mission, you see a German vehicle, you know, it's a the full battery, the full regiment, Pays, uh, turns its attention on that and then gets back to the matter at hand. And I think that is that concept of mass, just that, you know, just overwhelming, you know, even two or three very effective, highly trained vehicles and or highly trained crews and very capable vehicles. It's going to wear you down after a while. You're just, you're just not going to be able to stand that amount of firepower. Um, okay. So we'll just do a couple more questions before I let you kind of proceed. Cause they're, they're far coming in fast. So Ian Carr is asking, were these tank destroyers equipped with radios by 1943? Or was there some kind of command vehicle controlling things from behind? And then, because we know the German the Russians are still using like flags and a semaphore quite late in the war. So how does it work in terms of communications? These vehicles all had radios. Um, it's possible some of the early SU-76s did, and I'm not sure, but I know all the SU-85s, 100s, 152s, 122, they all had um, radios. They did have command vehicles. That's kind of an interesting side note. Um, the SU-76M was vulnerable to indirect fire because it was open top. So they decided to, well, instead of a SU-76M command vehicle, let's use a T-34. Well, the Germans aren't stupid. If you see 20 SU-76s and one T-34, it's not hard to figure out which one's a command vehicle. Mm. So they continued that with the SU-85s, but by, I think, mid-44, late-44, um, for both the 85s and the SU-100 formations, they went back to having a one of those vehicles be a, the dedicated command vehicle so it would not could not be picked out from the uh from the crowd um but yes they generally were radio linked you know radio linked uh internally and up the chain um i think uh if this i'm a little weak on this but i believe russian tactical radio nets were within the tactical formation and only a formation commander had any access up the chain of command but i could be wrong on that um, but that's particularly important for if there's any kind of indirect fire role for these things, anything where they're off the line a bit. Um, the SU-152s, the ISU-152s, their recommended in great engagement range was 2,000 meters. Um, one of the things I remember from the chieftain's chat with you was talking about median engagement range of like, you know, 500 meters. Um, when you have a <laughs> engagement ranges of 2,000 meters or for the SU-122s, you know, like 1,200, 1,400 meters, you're talking an entirely different type of terrain. But again, I think radio communication is essential to make sure your um, targeting is, is kind of in, is coordinated with, with whoever's at the point of attack. Okay, thank you. So while we're talking about ranges, then I'll hand it back to you. So Robin is asking about um, gun optics. You know, was the Soviet um, sighting um, devices better than the Germans, com comparable to the, what the Allies are using? Does they get, do they get better as the war go on? What's what's your kind of opinion on on, that, on the sighting of these these types of vehicles? I mean, wartime, I would have to say they're always behind the Germans a little bit. They did improve over the course of the war. Uh, what is interesting about these vehicles, as I said, the uh, I think the SU-76 only had the panoramic sights, which were more, more of an artillery sight. Um, the uh, ISU 122, ISU 152 had, by my understanding, both a telescopic and a panoramic sight. So one more suited for our, you know, our artillery role, one more suited for a direct fire or uh, uh, anti-tank role. Um, those telescopic sights, the ones that were more optimized for you know, direct fire or, or against enemy vehicular targets, 
um, did improve over the course of the war. One of the problems they had on the on the heavier vehicles was the site itself was only good to, out to about 800 meters, whereas they were engaging enemy vehicles at ranges much, you know, twice that. So they would have to use the uh, the panoramic azimuth type site, and it was uh, suboptimal. Eventually, those sites got better, and I believe they were able to engage with the telescopic site at a thousand meters or higher um, by the end of the war. I'm not sure what those exact numbers are, but they their sites did get better. I don't think they ever achieved what the Germans did in optics, not during the war anyway. Okay, thanks. Well, I'll let you carry on a bit now because we'll, we'll do another batch of questions later on. So back to you. Sure. Um, 1943, uh, early in 1943, the Soviets encountered Tigers. That was pretty exciting. Um, they did some experiments with uh, on the range to see what they could do against a Tiger. They discovered they had an 85 millimeter millimeter anti-aircraft gun that was pretty effective um that was determined to be the optimal um vehicular anti-tank gun uh going forward they did experiment a bit with a longer barrel 122 not the howitzer that they'd already mounted um they decided for various reasons not to go with the 122 and went with the 85. um here's where some design bureau rivalries kind of crop up as I said, there's artillery factory number nine that was near the UZTM vehicular plant. Um, they were producing a version of this uh, of this anti-aircraft weapon for use on vehicles. Um, the Central Artillery Design Bureau was, had one of their own. Um, as it turns out, they managed to produce four different prototype tank destroyers using various 85 millimeter weapons. Unsurprisingly, the pairing of the artillery factor number nine, 85 millimeter weapon, and the chassis produced by UZTM won out. Um, again, this is where the experience of having built the SU-122 worked the kinks out there, I think really uh, helped UZTM break through and achieve a lot of success with the SU-85. Now, this came online. They first produced these in August 1943, ultimately built you know over 2,600 of them. Um, it was a pretty successful vehicle, but even as it was being produced, they realized it was going to be an interim vehicle. They're already mounting 85 millimeter weapons on the T-34. Um, the idea was that these self-propelled guns would have heavier weapons than you know, the main tank force, and the main tank force was already at parity. So they started looking elsewhere, even as these things were rolling off the production line, to see what they could do going forward. Um, this is one of the, just for a quick sidelight in the mentality of Soviet R&D, I had this sense before I got into this a little bit of, you know, central planning, you know, the order comes up down from the top. We'll see if we, if, you know, everything's directed. You work on this, you work on this, and we'll see what we get at the end of the day. Whereas the actual development was, there was a little bit more, I won't call it free market by any means, but there was significant competition between various designs for everything to ultimately, you know, saw the field. It wasn't like they were throwing something out there, saw if it worked, and if it failed, they'd replace it. There was considerable work done in advance, considerable testing, um, a bit of battlefield testing, but they had a pretty solid working understanding of whether a vehicle would succeed before it actually hit the battlefield. And again, I'm talking, this is 1943. They have some luxury, you know, Moscow is no longer in danger. As Paul was saying, you know, the, the tide is clearly shifting. So, you know, that kind of eases, you know, the, the strain of, you know, looking for expedient solutions. But at the same time, I was more impressed than I, than I thought I'd be by the degree to which they had a competitive design process. Mm. Yes, yeah, definitely against what we think. You know, we, we think everything's just cobbled together and thrown in. And, and I, I've, I've done shows on the channel before when some of the key Red Army generals, they are kind of, they, they like artillery. And, and, you know, again, whether or not tank destroyers count really as part of the artillery branch or whether they're part of the tank branch or the infantry branch, but the use of, of, of massed um uh, offensive or defensive firepower such as this is something that the Soviet generals do seem to favor. There are some that there are a few absolute mad, keen tank proponents, but there are some right. German uh, Soviet commanders who don't really, the tank is still a bit newfangled and don't quite know what to do with them. But artillery is, is, is very popular quote unquote with some of the, with the Russians, whether that has an influence on the, on the amount of time spent on the designs, I don't know. Very possibly. I mean, it, it's it's easy to understand the effectiveness artillery of artillery. There's there's no question. 
And I, I will say, when you when you look at the size of some of these vehicles, it is almost comical how large an ISU 152 is compared to its contemporaries. I mean, th these are just ambitious vehicles, but th but they're effective. I mean, they, they pulled it off. They got these things out there. I mean, yeah, they don't call it the red god of war for nothing. When they get those big tubes online, they, they cause significant damage. I mean, Barbarossa, Bagration, I should say. Bagration was opened up by these things. And, yeah. uh, you know, the evidence is there. Okay. Um, more questions or should I go to the next slide? I guess the next slide, we'll do some more questions later on, I think. So here's some pictures of the SU-85. That, that one's, I think, at the shop itself, you know, just having fresh fresh off the assembly line. This one's got a little bit more wear on it. Now, the SU-100. So here we see, as I said, there is a recognition that they wanted a heavier weapon on their tank destroyer. Um, the SU-85 was fine. It was functional. It worked well. But if you already have the T-3485, it was almost superfluous. So they needed something heavier, particularly they're now encountering the, the SU-85 was, was struggling a bit with Panthers, for instance, couldn't always take out a Tiger. Ferdinand was was a real a real handful. Um, and what's funny is we know how many of these vehicles were actually produced, particularly like a Ferdinand. Not a great deal, but in terms of how they influenced Soviet development, it was significant. I mean, it was like, how do we kill this particular tank? There might only be a couple dozen of them out there, but this is the vehicle that, that you know, we're kind of obsessed with, with defeating. Um, and it kind of shaped a lot of these processes going, and these, you know, specs going forward. But anyway, so they looked at a few different weapons. They decided the 100 millimeter was going to be their, their best option in terms of just, you know, the, the size of shell, penetrating power and availability. Um, again, bureaucratic meddling, the, this is where the maybe the central planning interfered a bit. They were instructed to use a particular 100 millimeter piece called S34. I think this was also came out of the Central Artillery Design Bureau, the the, you know, the, the rivals of Artillery Factory Number Nine. Um, number Nine was producing the D10S, which uh, the S basically means a, a, a D10 gun on a um, optimized for a for a self propelled vehicle. Um, despite what the people at UZTM were asking, they were instructed that they had to mount a, a weapon with all the characteristics of the S34. Um, so what they did is they optimized the D10 to reflect the ballistics of the S34 and went ahead and produced that. Um, so in the end, just uh, th again, the cooperation between those two entities uh, produced a successful vehicle. They had plenty of the 100 millimeter guns themselves being available. However, ammunition was a bit in short supply. So while the SU-100 production line was running, they went ahead and mounted available 85 millimeter weapons on them. To, you'll see something called the SU-85M, and it's an 85 millimeter gun on an SU-100 chassis, which is basically a little bit up-armored um, SU-85. Um, ultimately, the, the ammo situation was resolved, and by early um, 45, the the 100 what was the primary weapon being being mounted um as a vehicle these suffered a little bit of trouble the 100 millimeter gun was significantly heavier so these things started having issues in their forward suspension um the uztm ended up having to kind of do post-production modifications on on the front of these chassis just to keep them from breaking down but it still was it was a good performing weapon it, it served its its purpose and in a defeating Panthers and uh, Tiger ones struggled a bit with, with the uh, Tiger II. Um, they served through the end of the war alongside the SU-85. The SU-85 served to the end of the war as well. So the, the 100 didn't really replace it. it. It just basically came online next to it. And the SU-100 went on to serve uh, well past the end of the war. And in fact, uh, we'll, we'll see a picture here shortly. Uh, the Syrians were using them on the Golan High. I don't think particularly successfully, but they at least had enough enough faith in their potential to possibly uh, to, to possibly have an effect against the Israelis. But we can see some pictures of these as we go through. There's the 85M, that's a 85 millimeter gun on the on the 100 chassis. Uh, these are 100s lined up at the factory. One moment. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, my computer's- Okay, me. let me know if there's anything else I can help you. <laughs> Third guest. Yes, yes, he's uh, irrepressible. Again, another SU-100, and there's the uh, Syrian SU-100 on the Golan Heights. And like I say, it probably didn't have a particularly good day that day. I don't think anyone did, actually. 
Um, so, I mean, that, that that's the run of the dedicated tank destroyers, um, which ends at the SU-100. But as Paul was mentioning earlier, we know what defines a tank destroying weapon. Um, alongside these, we had, you know, the big boys, the SU-152, ISU-122, and ISU-152. Um, these were all doctrinally assault guns, um, but they all served effectively as tank destroyers. And I believe the ISU-122 was really considered a tank destroyer first and foremost as the war went on, um, and that was its, its, its primary mission. Um, they all had both telescopic and panoramic sights. Um, their main role was to be enter battle four to 600 meters behind a leading tank formation and firing another four or 600 meters beyond the forward edge of, of the uh, engaged Soviet forces. Um, and again, massing fire on individual targets. I mean, this sort of idea of, of mass that, that just permeates, you know, the Soviet Red Army doctrine really holds with, with the assault guns more than anything else. I mean, they are kind of like the, the most visible manifestation of that idea of just a lot of metal downrange and they, they, they did it quite well. Um, the lessons that they seem to constantly relearn though, close protection. I mean, until the end of the war, there are still like guys just talking about, I had to get out of my vehicle, take my submachine gun, hose off my battery mate to my right, get back in my vehicle, and then, you know, make sure that didn't happen again. They were begging for, you know, pull-mounted machine guns. They never got them. I, as I said, I think they put more and more field-expedient AA guns. I think they started um, carrying um, DPM light machine guns as well mm. in addition to their submachine guns. Um, the other thing was attack versus defense. These things tend to get in trouble when they, on the attack. They got a little ahead of their, you know, a little over their skis sometimes and found themselves, you know, tactically overmatched by turreted mobile um, panzers um, and they kept returning to that doctrine of mass again and again you just see that repeated these things need to be used on mass um, you know guided by that by that command vehicle in conjunction with um, you know brother formations whether they be tank or infantry um, I mean overall I think it was a it was a pretty successful concept I think they were very effective uh, the ISU 152 I think they ended up producing until 1959 which seems pretty remarkable um, I don't know if they saw any action on the battlefield past Korea. Again, if somebody knows, I'd, I'd be look forward to finding out. Um, but I'd be happy to field some you know, general questions if you've got some built up there. Yeah, and, and you've got some um, your sources of your last slide. There, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So this is where some of the, the information has come from, folks. And we'll do a few questions. There's a few couple of built up, and then we'll do some others that have um, that have come in. So um, so let's hold that on screen for a second there. So the first question. Um, is about the how well were the crews trained? Now you talked about the fact that that by the, the mid-war there's a dedicated tank destroyer branch, and in fact Trent Tolenko, another viewer, is going to ask you how that works. But do we know about how they were trained? Are they are they trained well in terms of just how artillery? Because as David Patterson said, yes, a lot of artillery use it's math. It's 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 it's, yeah. it's lots and lots of mathematics. So do we know how well the Soviet crews are trained? I, well, I think early war, they again, the expedience there, they're probably throwing those guys into the front, you know, a lot in a lot more raw state than they were as, as time went on. By 1943, I mean, the crews of these SU 85s, uh, SU 100s, they were getting significant training. They were, you know, as you said, that there's just the mass themselves for the um, SU 122s, ISU uh, crews. Those folks were artillery branch as well. So they had to master the math of indirect fire, and that's not trivial. So I think those guys were going out with significant training under the belt. Um, they also did some uh, interesting cross training. I know ISU-122 crews um, or units were um, formed from IS-2 tank crews who had s seen action in battle because they found the IS, uh, ISU-122 was a, was a great anti-tank platform. And they take crews from the IS-2s put them to ISU-122s, which I thought was kind of an interesting wrinkle to this. But again, those were experienced crewmen. Um, but the luxury of seeing that frontline peak and then recede, I think, uh, gave them kind of the confidence to give these troops the, the training they need to be effective in battle. Okay, thanks. 
So David Kay has talked about the IS-152 uh, had two pieces of munitions which greatly reduced the rate of fire. Sometimes bigger is not always better. So in your opinion, the, the Soviets do, you know, they get, the calibers get bigger, the guns get bigger, the vehicles get bigger. It's, as with all armor developed, where they talk about main battle tanks, where there does come a point where size works against you. Everything becomes slower, rearming, I think. Do you think the Soviets went a bit too big towards the end? You were saying they were having some problems knocking out King Tigers, but let's face it, they're not. you're not going to come across King Tigers every day. I mean, the Germans don't make many of them. So did they get a little bit um, cautious about some of these 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 um, German vehicles that had the big guns that we, as you said yourself, they didn't actually make many of? Did they kind of go a bit too big? I, I think that's a fair observation. One of the things that's interesting are the comments on uh, in the testing of the SU-100, which was a... That, that's a significant size gun is it's bigger than anything we had in the U S field on a vehicle, you know, at least in, in action during the war. Um, but they found the rate of fire on the SU 100 was comparable to the SU 85. Now the 152 millimeter round is another story entirely. Those things did have a slow rate of fire, but here again, I think is why they counted on that mass. They wanted that full regiment engaged. So each individual vehicle might be, struggling to get rounds down range, but as a formation, that regiment is still throwing significant metal at the Germans. And so I can't, you know, I'm not sure during the war outside of Operation Conrad on the East Front, where, where are the Germans, you know, even fielding 20 vehicles in one tactical engagement um, on the same frontage as, as a tank destroyer regiment. So I would think even with a slow rate of fire, they're probably matching round for round for what was coming back. But I think that is a very fair observation. There is a point at which you just just the ergonomics of trying to handle that that size of ordinance has got to you know kind of detract from your overall effectiveness but they seem comfortable with it i mean they, they build a, a lot of those uh i think they've ended up building 4600 uh, isu 152s over the course of the war on top of the su 152s of which they build a considerable amount as well so they seem pretty happy with with whatever um whatever shortcomings that the uh, ammo might have had they were pleased with the overall result okay so Trent Olenka, thank you. He's just asking about to um, to explain again how the Soviet high command allocate t uh, tank destroyer units. And again, does it change as the war goes on or the latter part of the war? Well, I'm, I'm very happy to have a conversation by proxy with Trent because I, I, I quite enjoy the uh, a lot of the things he, he's been throwing up on Twitter. Uh, I love your PTO uh, electronic warfare stuff. That, that's fantastic. But anyway, back to, to your question. Um, so these were typically uh, assigned as regiments two more mobile formations. So a Soviet cavalry regiment would have a um, would have a tank destroyer regiment, or a Soviet cavalry corps would have a tank destroyer regiment assigned to it. A tank corps would as well as would a um, the, the mechanized corps. And they were usually operating in conjunction with with a what they called a heavy self-propelled artillery regiment, which would be a uh, ISU 122 or ISU 152. So those would go in conjunction. You'd have like SU 100s beside a ISU 152 as, as supporting um, formations in a larger corps. Now, as I'm sure a lot of people realize, Soviet corps aren't really what we think of as corps. They're more like very large divisions in terms of actual manpower strength. Um, but that was kind of like their operational unit at, at, at which level um, these kind of assets would be assigned. And I think they had a total of five or six tank destroyer brigades, which were obligations of uh, three regiments. And I don't know if these were assigned at army or front level, but those again would be applied to to the to the point of attack. You know, uh, I think most people are familiar with the idea of a red army is always reinforcing success. So you can imagine that those things were assigned to follow on as a breakthrough um, whenever they did have the successes they did during migration and whatnot. Okay, thanks for that. Um, people, it was, I can't find the actual copy mark there. People were asking, how would we rate, for example, the SU 85 against the M18 Hellcat, for example? I mean, and it, and it gets, these comparisons get difficult because the 85 bigger gun, but but it's about doctrine, it's about use, it's about how are they using with the Hell, how Hellcat is very fast. So do, do you want to kind of comment on that? Or do you, is, is it, is it, do you want to plead the fifth on that one? <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know if you saw my email address. I'm kind of biased on this, but I think the Hellcat was a great platform. Um, I think it might have been the superior platform during the war because I mean, it had a combination of speed and firepower, visibility, you know, communication. 
I don't know if you can count this, but supporting arms, you know, <laughs> a Hellcat comes part of a package that includes a lot of artillery. Exactly. Now, of course, the, the SUs did as well. But I think that between the mobility and the turreted vehicle, um, I think that the gun might not have performed at the level of the, of the 85 millimeter, but I think it was certainly adequate against most expected opposition. So, I, I mean, I would prefer the Hellcat. One of the things about these Soviet tank destroyers and assault guns is they tended to be much better armored than their contemporaries and other services um, because they reflected the chassis. I mean, the one was built on a T-34. I mean, the ISUs were, were coming out on, on basically, you know, IS-2 chassis. That, that, that's a, a well-armored vehicle. Um, I mean, a very large vehicle didn't have much slope to that casemate, but th there is a lot of metal between you and the enemy. Um, that, I think, occasionally could get you into trouble. Um, the SU-100 crews did complain, you know, if I'm expected to knock out tigers, um, I'm, you know, I'm 60% to kill a tiger. A tiger is pretty much 95% to kill me. And that, that kind of uh, inequity, I think, uh, <laughs> wore heavily on them uh, in, in an engagement. Um, whereas I think the, uh, the Hellcat is explicitly designed not to be hit. I mean, if you, if they're shooting at you, you've already failed in, in your, in yeah, your mission. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Whereas I think these things were expected to engage a little bit more aggressively. Okay. And then given that David Patterson was talking a lot about forward observers yesterday, given that the ranges increase as the, as the guns get bigger, um, how does it work? Or does, is there a system for forward observation? Because, you know, 2000 yard ranges is all very well having a command vehicle behind, but what about who is sighting, who is in, in the indirect fire role, if, if they're indeed they're using indirect fire role. I, I have to say, I, I cannot answer that question definitively. Um, as I said, they do. They were kitted out to perform indirect fire. Um, they had. They were on the radio net, so presumably they had the communication necessary for indirect fire. But I don't know organizationally or doctrinally how they were linked to forward observing teams. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that I've ever read anything about that. But um, is there uh, so anything else? Smedley's asking about: Are they all manual traverse and elevation? Anything else about the mechanics of the of the Soviet tank destroyers that you think is worth pointing out that would be different to the German or American variant or British variants? Uh, I, I think it's it's all what you'd expect. You know, the hand cranks and whatnot. Um, the exigencies of, of putting a very large piece of ordnance in, in a small area um, created ergonomic factors. Um, I recommend if you haven't seen it, I think the Chieftain goes inside a couple of these vehicles. Yeah. I mean, the uh, the ISU 152 is a comfortable one bedroom apartment, but the uh, the SU 85 is is a little bit more crowded. And a lot of design issues were just simply how do you manage that breach? How much traverse can you allow um, to be both tactically effective and have the crews actually serve the weapon? Um, at least one of the vehicles, I think the SU 122. Um, you know, fully traversed to one side, the commander was basically pinned against the inside of the hull, which isn't a good place to be. Um, so they certainly had issues internally. Um, but in terms of the actual mechanics of elevating and traversing, same as, as on anybody else's um, weapon, no, nothing electric or anything like that. It was all all hand crank. Okay. Um, so a couple more questions. So Great Dominion is asking, any use of heat rounds in Russian tank destroyers? They developed a heat round for the 122. I think they had one for the 152 i'm not sure it was it was used all that much but the 122 certainly had a heat round um the 85 had an apcr round as well no heat for that I don't, um, i'm not sure if it had heat i know that they basically served with with a mix of ap apcr and he though okay so shell drake david from last night is telling in the soviet system the field artillery battery command post was also the okay. observation post so any uh, SU vehicle assigned as indirect fire resources would likely have been netted into the field gunner's radio. So thank you very much for that, Great, David. Um, and Richard Trainer is asking, he said, I read a Kindle and a Kindle, an account by Vasily Chrysoff. Was it a credible account of an SA, SU-85 commander? I, I can't. I, I've read the same account. I don't know if it's credible or not. I certainly enjoyed it. <laughs> so, But no, I'm with you. I just uh, I, I cannot say how true to life that actually was. Okay, and then my question, sort of continuing from that, really, is we talk a lot about the, the Soviet propaganda and how and the, and the Germans are masters of propaganda, the tank cases, the the the, the, the air races. Do the Soviets make any kind of deal about some of the um the tank destroyer crews, or, or or in terms of kind of you know putting them in front of the people and decorating them publicly? They were certainly decorated. Um, 
I don't know how public the decorations were, but there are many accounts of of tank crews and tank destroyer crews, assault gun crews, um, being decorated after specific engagements. Um, you can find a lot of those on uh, on Peter's site, Tank Archive. We'll will have a few of those. Um, so certainly their role was recognized. I'm not sure if I don't know if they painted you know kill stripes on their barrels or anything like that. I've seen no evidence of that, but I know they were there. Uh, you know, the performance was certainly recognized at higher levels. Okay. And, and then the, probably maybe the last question is, you know, in your reading about this, just for not, not just for this show, but generally, I mean, us historians who study the Eastern Front, we make these comparisons across the theaters. Do you think that there's a bit of a misunderstanding about, about the effectiveness of some of the Soviet stuff? I said at the beginning there, we still have this idea of kind of, armor plate bolt on the tractors and everything's a bit rough and ready is it time for re-evaluation perhaps okay the russians right now are the not the, not the flavor of the month in terms of globally yeah. what they're doing in ukraine but in terms of understanding their world war ii are, are we still dismissing their technology a little bit too much i, I think there's been something of, of like a reassessment certainly i think uh i mean over the years their operational skills have been reassessed to be much more significant um, I, I think people starting to see maybe they were actually even outperforming the Germans at that level a lot earlier than, than people realize in terms of Maskarovka and what they're doing, you know, with with mid-level formations. But but their kit was was pretty solid. I mean, they, these were effective vehicles, but I think it was a combination of the vehicles themselves and the doctrine with which they applied them. I mean, that, that combination proved to be very, very successful. I mean, they still suffered horrendous casualties. Um, but they were on a mission to, to drive an invader from their soil. And as we see today, you know, that, that's, that's high motivation. Um, mm. and, and that alone accounts for uh, you know, some shortcomings in other areas. But I think by, by 1944, 1945, um, it's, it's, you can talk about one, one versus one comparisons. Is a Panther better than T-34? Certainly. Is a Panther better than four T-34s? Not really. And that's what they're facing. And that is not, any knock on the T-34, which itself is an effective piece of equipment. And the ISU-152, you get in, you go into a place like, you know, um, by the time they get to Berlin, that's the vehicle you want for fighting your way into, a, into an enemy's fortified um, capital. And it, it, it did the trick. So I think they, their kit was, was solid. It was, it was quite capable. Um, did it have the fit and finish that we've come to expect in the West? Probably not. That was not their priority, but it wasn't an effective battlefield piece of ordnance certainly as a vehicle it worked it, was it reliable it was reliable enough um to, to get where it needed to go um so i think yeah i think they've had a bad rap i do think that rap has receded i think people yeah. do recognize them for being a effective and pragmatic uh research and designers and, and producers of effective war making equipment i think also by bagration as well that their combined arms use is pretty good you know that they've got a lot of different tools in a toolbox to continue that analogy they've got you know the rocket firing vehicles they've got tank, tank destroyers tank hunters tanks infantry and, and and air power as well and they seem pretty good at moving those forces over the distances that they're doing as well and keeping it all working together the allies you know, the western allies as we know we're always talking about it we're still struggling you know we were struggling in north africa we were things were getting better in tunisia but then there's some there's some backward steps normandy italy things are getting better but still not perfect but the right. but, but i would say probably for the soviets bagration is about the peak it gets slows down again when they get towards berlin and, and things because the, the the nature of combat changes a bit but sure bagration is a really good i think example of, of everything working pretty well together well i think also something that uh the nature of the terrain changes as well. I mean, the engagement yeah. ranges across Ukraine are, are one thing. By the time that they're, they've crossed Poland or getting into Germany, I mean, you've got a much different terrain look. And I think, you know, tactics and engage, and just, you know, general coordination type elements that you're used that have worked for like the last nine months. I don't say they have to go out the window, but you're, you're kind of relearning how to fight. And they took casualties too. I mean, there's, now, bagration what was a romp but a lot a lot of soviets died so well, that, that is true it's very it, it is it always always costly so we'll do a couple more questions if you don't if you don't mind so hosen fur is asking what about the lend lease half tracks with the 57 millimeter ak the su57 how are these fielded and did the crews like them uh i read a little bit about the about that uh vehicle and the other applications they actually put a 57 millimeter on the on a t34 that that saw some action um it was it had 
it was well liked as a weapon. It was had very flat arc. It, it, it hit where you pointed it, but ultimately it just didn't. They felt it didn't have a heavy enough of enough round, and the vehicles that were was mounted on were not particularly survivable, particularly those half tracks. Um, the T thirty four with the fifty seven. I don't know if they fielded a full tank brigade with them, but they did have a very successful successful engagement. But ultimately, as things turned out, I think most of them were, were knocked out and it was withdrawn from service of survivors. But anyway, it was a, it was a well regarded weapon. But once they identified the eighty five millimeter as the way forward, it, it led on to, to big, even bigger things. And the fifty seven just continued to serve as a crew served uh, towed weapon, but not as a um, not as a vehicle mount. Okay, thank you very much. Couple more, Kevin Jones. Were there any female tank destroyer crews? Possibly. I've seen some pictures. I don't know whether those were propaganda or whether they were actually engaged. I, I know female tank crews existed, but I don't know if, about the, on the TD side. Okay. And from Jim is asking, was the Panzerfaust a dangerous weapon for Soviet tank destroyers? I mean, you were talking about the lack of the hull machine guns for that, you know, infantry getting around you. I, I, do they get close enough to be taken out by Panzerfaust or Panzerschrecks? Again, if they were close enough to get taken out by a Panzerfaust, somebody's made a mistake. Um, but they certainly were, um, judging from what we've read. Uh, they they were just very vulnerable to close combat, generally. Uh, and again, I, mean, I go back to that picture of, of that uh, SU-76M in, in in Berlin. I mean, or I think it was Vienna. The, the idea of city fighting and open top vehicles. I mean, I, I don't know if a German needs a Panzerfaust to take out one of those. But yes, they were certainly vulnerable to them. Pensafiles could penetrate any one of these vehicles without any problem. Well, Brent, well, I think we'll leave it there, JR, because a nice short show means it'll do well, well on the repeat repeat views. <laughs> We've covered it. We'll just have you back at another point, another point, and we'll we'll go down another rabbit hole and talk about something else. But it's been a really fantastic introduction to the subject for most people. There are a couple of people watching who clearly know their subject, but most people, it's 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 fairly a, a, pretty much of a new a new subject for them. So it's been brilliant. Um, you've broken your duck. You've done your first World War II TV show. You right. happy to come back in the future at some point? I'd love it. I'd love to come back. And I, and I hope if anybody has any questions or more importantly, corrections, please comment on, on Paul's channel so we can see them and maybe we can respond directly because I'm always learning more. Like I say, I've, I've learned a great deal in the last couple of years. I'm by no means an expert, but I'm always happy to uh, to learn more. But well, that's, the, that's the thing about this channel and other channels is that the the pool of knowledge out there is enormous and people are really happy to exchange. They're really happy to share ideas and, and, and none of us can know it all. None of us have read every archive. None of us has read every book. So it's a, again, a thank you to the community for being so fantastic in supporting uh, myself and my guests. So there we are. I will all see right. you all again tomorrow, folks. This is a uh, Paul Bodesh, World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, JR. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.